Oh, crap. Well, I don't know what happened here. <laughs> we hear you, Irv. Are you? Yeah, I'm back. I'm back. <laughs> You're here. <laughs> I was taking a tour of the screen accidentally. <laughs> I'm not, I know the uh, technology is not a friend of mine. All right. Okay. So, hi, Yvonne. Nice to see hi. you. Hey. <laughs> I'm sorry I missed all the great stuff. Yeah, that's all right. You know, yeah. um, you were with us in spirit and um, you're here now and I'm really happy about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> hold on one second. I'm going to go ahead and call our meeting to order here. Um, so it's 2.03. I'm calling to order the October 31st meeting of the African Heritage African Heritage Reparation Assembly. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time. And I'm gonna do a sound check and I will start with you, Jennifer. Can hear you. I can hear you. Can you hear me? <laughs> now we can, yeah. Great. <laughs> All right, Ms. Bridges. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and Dr. Rhodes. I can hear everyone and I can see everyone. Great. Um, and Yvonne. Yes, I can see everyone and you can hear me, I hope. And I can hear everyone. Heard, definitely. And Pamela. Uh, I can see and hear everyone. Great. All right. I do know um, that Hala will be unable to join us today. I think that Dr. Shabazz is planning on joining us. He may be late. And I'm not sure about um, Alex Alexis, uh, though. Just send a quick text. Um, all right. So on our agenda for today is to talk a little bit about the listening session that we hosted last Thursday um, to hear member responses, reactions, questions, and then to begin to dovetail that into our discussion about use of funds and eligibility. I know that Dr. Shabazz was going to provide some framework to us, and I think he planned to do that today. I also wanted to take some time. Um, Jennifer and I had a great conversation following the listening session related to community engagement and how we might, since we've had this kickoff event um, and taking what we know about that event, uh, how we might continue with our engagement efforts um, to reach more Black residents. And so um, that's something that I think we have some specific ideas about, and we can talk about that as well. Um, so let's just start by talking reactions. I know, Yvonne, you weren't able to be there. Um, there is a video. Alexis is just incorporating the slides that we used. Um, and then that will be definitely for internal purposes. And we need to decide as a committee in terms of, and I will talk with um, Pamela and Jennifer about that too, in terms of distributing it or, or how that how that should go because there have been people, it's totally public at this point. I mean, it was covered by NEPM. It was covered by the Indy. Um, there was some great, great coverage. So if you haven't, I think I sent that some of that to you all. Um, so we probably want to make that video available, um, but maybe we want to review what Amherst Media put together and then have a discussion about that. So um, the floor is open. If anyone would like to just share reactions, um, share questions, concerns, anything about the listening session on Thursday. And just a little, oh yes, I'm gonna go to you, Ms. Bridges, just to give Yvonne a, a, a 
an idea we had of over 70 people um, in attendance and very well attended. We had some very rich, I think, discussion. Um, it was in the beginning parts, a little quiet. And then as people got comfortable talking, it, it really uh, rolled really nicely from there. So yes, Ms. Bridges. I was um, impressed with the students. I was really impressed with the Amherst College students and I think a couple from Hampshire College, but I was very, very impressed. I'm always impressed with Cyrus because he's <laughs> something, but I was impressed with how much they, their input was to do and what they don't see. Um, like one student said he was surprised that they didn't have um, street names after Black people. Um, you know, and he was surprised when, you know, when he was also told Nina Simone was here. And I let him know, actually, Natalie Cole, went, I went to school with her. Well, she was leaving as I was a freshman, but there, yeah. and, and not just, um, not just famous people, but people that have done things, Black people that have done things in this town. Um, well, Yusuf Latif you know, went to what, school you know, was like here. We, we were putting, it's like, for, for instance, my grandfather, who was 106, and he was a famous banjo player. Mm -hmm. And he's up on the mural. I mean, you know, and, you know, not just him. There's other people like, um, you know, um, Maddie, who had the, uh, the um, boarding house on McClellan Street. Um, mm -hmm. Um, you know, different things. My, my, I mean, I'm sorry, you know, not to my home, but even my dad who got the plaques and, and raised money for the plaques. There's not that many you could put out there, but I mean, it would be nice. Yeah. You have, you have other ones, you have Dickinson, you, <laughs> you know, so he, these students made up a very good point is why isn't, you know, why he was surprised to say, why isn't there a street? So I thought that they were very, they, they were very, they, they were to the point and, and raised a lot of questions and like a why not. And these are kids out of the mass of babes. Yeah. Yeah, I observed that too, Ms. Bridges. And I, I thought that here, it was such a fresh perspective in many ways coming from them. And um, I thought that was really powerful. Um, and I will say that Cyrus let me know after the event, the inauguration for the president of Amherst College was on Friday afternoon. And Cyrus was the student, a student speaker. And he tells me that he talked about um, the president uh, being open to listening about reparations and what's happening in the town. And so he spoke very publicly in this very, were you there, Pamela? No. No, I wasn't at the inauguration, but I, um, when I, the Amherst resident talked about the Amherst College um, taking their family property, it, I mean, it very clearly, like that's an easy thing to document and for the college to make reparations would be, you know, appropriate. So I immediately thought um, that that would be something that they could act on if they chose to. And um, Jen and I have a meeting coming up on the 9th with um, uh, some Amherst College uh, staff, diversity staff. They have several different offices, but well, that will be something I think that we can also mention during our, our meeting on the night. Um, That's great. Yeah. Any way to tie that all in. Um, Cyrus also informed me after hearing, um, so uh, Yvonne, just so you know, um, T.C. Coleman is a resident of the community and has had family here dating back to the beginning of um, the town's inception. So he was not able to be at the listening session, but he shared a very 
powerful story um, of his grandmother's house being taken, basically purchased for a small amount um, by Amherst College in return for um, caring for the house. And um, in the end, they never did care for the house and it was in shambles at the time she died. And then it was bulldozed very shortly after. Um, and Cyrus tells me that he has already been in touch with Mike Kelly, who's the archivist at Amherst College and others to dig into that particular story and stories like that um, in that area. So yes, Pamela, that would be really great to just sort of keep that alive. Um, Thank you, Ms. Bridges. Thank you for sharing that. That was, <laughs> I saw that you sat down with a couple of the students after, and um, so I knew you were probably feeling that. <laughs> um, would anyone else like to share um, reactions, questions, concerns? I wanted, can I add, I, had, I didn't go, but I, I was really moved, to, um, Deborah, by your stories of, you know, this student who said naming streets after, you know, Black folks in Amherst. And I think maybe that's one of the things that we add to our list of, of things to do from the committee. Um, we've had some really great jazz musicians who have lived here and been here. Youssef Latif is one of them. Um, um, Archie Shep as well has been in the area. I'm not sure if his house is actually in Amherst, but him as well. Um, Natalie Cole did go to Amherst College and her sister as well. Wow. Say it again. She actually went to UMass. Oh, she did. Her sister she went, went to, to Amherst College. And, um, yeah. Max Roach also. Yes, I mean, and Max to Roach. babysit for his children. I took a class with Archie Shea. Ab ab absolutely. My brother played with, with Max Roach. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there's a and lot, there's a lot of them. These um, are musicians who are, are world Baldwin class. James Baldwin, definitely. That's he, yeah, he, that's he, who the student first brought up about yeah. James, James Baldwin. Yeah, James Baldwin. Yeah, definitely. So there's no lack of people we could name streets for. <laughs> You know, even the well well known and not as well known. And yeah, not definitely. as well known. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So like I agree with you. If they've got Emily Dickinson, this and that and this and that, we've got a whole bunch. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and um, when Dr. Shabazz and I spoke to the Amherst College Senate earlier last week, and he he talks better about this, but he talked about that sort of um, like sense of place. And um, he was saying, we don't need to remove names like Dickinson and other names, but there are lots of streets that have zero significance, West or, you know, something that has not no tie to anything that can be easily changed. You they do it, but you know, <laughs> New, New York City does it all the time. You know what I mean? Like there's streets, you know, people still call, you know, like um, in Harlem, there are avenues that are still called like 23rd Street or Third Avenue or whatever. But then it's like, you know, it's it, it's renamed MLK Boulevard or something. It's got, you know, the, so there's that, you know, that it's not like, yeah, like you said, we're not taking away, but we can add, you know. And then what happens? Folks are like, Whose name is that? Yusef Latif Boulevard? Who's Yusef Latif? And they look it up and then they know more about Amherst and about Yusef Latif, you know, as a great musician. Yeah. It's great. <laughs> yeah. Um, Ms. Bridges. Yeah, again, it's it's not about taking the the names down, like you said. You can you can even put you can, I've seen some places have two street names up there. But like you said, you know, you could, there could be something that's not, you know, West Street, okay, put it up there or, you know, and anything that's not, you know, you know, uh, Dickinson is, you don't, you're not going to do anything with that. But there are other streets all over the place that, you know, you could change, you know, you could change Amity Street, you could change, you know, there's, there's, there's so many of them. That if you just look and put down the map saying, oh, they, we could change that name or whatever. But it, it makes sense to at least put a, you know, half, at least a half a dozen they could do. 
at least. I, hey, I say way more than that. Yeah, yeah, but you know, I'm just, I'm just, a start yeah. would be nice. And that's yeah. how I see it happening here. A start would be nice. Absolutely. Yeah. And also, you know, there are facilities that are town owned. There are other. So that is one sort of piece of, and I'm, I'm, as these things start to come up, I'm, you know, we'll keep, keep notes here. Um, so that sort of naming, um, and, and that came up very strongly. I think, I think one, uh, Hampshire college student, it was very powerful. She said, um, that she was newer to the community and that she just straight up felt uncomfortable here. Like she just remember that. And the way she said it was just, whoa. Um, it wasn't just like, yeah, I don't feel comfortable. It was like very powerful the way she said it. Um, Dr. Rhodes, did you have any impressions that you'd like to share from the listening session? I, I was just thinking that uh, all these famous people, especially Yusef Latif, who I knew well, uh, mm -hmm. sat in around the couch with them at various homes. And uh, it's sort of like we forget that these great musicians, Matt Roach was another one. I mean, they were, they were here, walked our streets, played. You know, um, and that there aren't any streets. Just, I, I'm actually was stunned when I heard that. I think, wow, it's true. We don't. We really do not have any streets named after a lot of great people who have walked these streets in Amherst, visited the restaurants, played music, etc. You know, these are you know, Yusef Latif is a giant giant and uh it's amazing that i just i'm just shocked when i think about it yeah right you know you set the teeth but maybe sometimes familiarity uh with people that you knew uh you don't think about well why aren't we honoring them mm -hmm. in this town yeah welcome dr shabazz um can you hear us Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay. We're just talking. Um, we're sharing responses to the listening session. And Ms. Bridges um, kicked us off by sharing uh, what the, the sense from some of the college students, particularly around street naming. Um, and I wanted to ask you, Dr. Shabazz, you, you referred to that as something when we were at Amherst College. What what, what did you, because I'm keeping notes for myself. What did you call that? Something space? Oh, you're muted. Hi, I think they were um, re referring to the language about the symbolic conquest of public space. Got it. Perfect. Yeah. I wanted to get that. And um, Pamela. So um, I did try to take notes during the the listening session. So I, I will share those with Jennifer and we can type them up and get back to you. Um, just my general impressions was um, I thought the organization of the event went fairly well. Uh, I thought it was really important to talk about the brave space and ropes to sort of set a container. Um, there were of the you know many different suggestions that we got from uh, the participants there about the use of funds, I, there were two things that I that really struck me: um, the stabilization fund, and then a lot of comments around education. But I actually think, Dr. Shabazz, you said the thing that really struck me the most, which was around thinking about the use of the funds for uh, uh, eliminating the wealth gap. And so I think if you really took that as your direction, um, you would, you know, start to help you 
create the criteria for eligibility and for use of the funds if you, you know, if you start to focus in. Um, I thought that was really key and really resonated. And I think you could get a lot of, a, um, of a agreement among the community about focusing either on stability or education um, with a greater goal of sort of eliminating the wealth gap. Um, and then the other things that we talked about was you know, like, of course, you know, $2 million will not go a long way and it will take you 10 years to get there. So what do you do in the interim, you know, um, and thinking, so I actually left the meeting sort of thinking about, so what would I do if I, uh, if I had the responsibility that you guys have of deciding how to utilize the funds and, um, and I didn't want to wait until I'd gotten to the $2 million mark. So one thing would be to think about uh, limiting the amount of uh, funds you utilize over the 10 year period. So setting aside uh, $100,000 a year until you got to the million dollar mark and then you, know, you sort of create a, a larger pot of money that you can utilize going forward. Or you know, Jennifer and I have been talking about other uh, funding streams. I think it's going to be hard to find grantors for reparations, but what other opportunities would there be to grow your fund? Um, yeah. And Jen, remind me, there was something else we talked about, and so you might have to jump in. So, um, I think, did you talk about the, the five harms? So oh, yeah, that another way that you could um, could sort of set up the criteria for your funds would be to think about using those five harms as a framework. So that would give you, you know, five categories that you generally start to think about um, distribution of funds for. So um, anyway, I do think it was a, a really good start, and uh, you know that as you continue to work on community engagement, you know, obviously more ideas will come up. So. Absolutely. And I just, I really want to thank you, Jennifer and Pamela for being there. And um, it was just wonderful to have you there and have you right at the front greeting people. And the funny moment when, <laughs> when <laughs> Jennifer raised something to sort of help uh, facilitate what we were saying. And the NEPM reporter <laughs> turned around with his, do you remember that, Jennifer, with his big, long speaker? And you're like, this oh, extra wow. long microphone. And I was like, wow, okay. How convenient. Yeah. <laughs> that was really funny. Um, okay, Dr. Rhodes. One of the things that struck me uh, afterwards, and I was thinking about it, and when the comments about the $2 million, uh, that one of the things that we as HRA should pursue is to have that fund matched by Amherst College and UMass, that they could match it. And that is something that we should figure out how to take forward and implement. Do they do this when there's good words said? <laughs> I'm doing that. <laughs> uh, yeah, then that will take some strategy and in collaboration um, and, and education. And, and so, yes, absolutely. Um, I am going to just pause because we do have three attendees and we have two public comment periods generally. So I'm going to call a public comment period being that it's 226 um, and give folks an opportunity to weigh in here or provide public comment. Um, during the public comment period, I will recognize members of the public when called on. Please identify yourself by stating your name, pronouns, and address. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes, and we will not engage in a dialogue necessarily. Um, sometimes we will respond if there's a question, um, but we'll definitely be listening very closely. So if you would like to make public comment, please use the raise hand function now and we will bring you into the room. And 
uh, we can also make another time later if um, you'd like to make public comment later. It looks like we have um, maybe Lauren. I think it's Lauren. <laughs> can you hear us? I think if you can unmute. There, oh, just heard you for a second there. Hello? Yes, there you go. <laughs> yes, hi. Um, I don't do the pronouns on today. I'm a mother and I will do my address. It's um, Long Metal Drive. Um, I was at the um, listening session and I'm happy that it, it you know, finally happened. Um, I did, uh, you know, try to jot down my thoughts. Um, so I, I do have a few things to, to share. Um, one, the first thing, um, the listening session, I wish there was like a questionnaire for, you know, all of the attendees to, you know, fill out even just, you know, writing down what their thought of what rep reparations means to them would have been nice to like, you know, capture, uh, because I don't think a lot of people, um, although they were listening, I don't think they shared their, their thoughts. Um, so that would have been nice. Um, and um, I think that uh, why we are still asking the question, um, what, what does reparations mean to Amherst and, and the black community? I wish that we were more farther along in answering that um, and not like discussing or debating um, that question. Um, also, I feel that, you know, I, I wonder what happened to the BAM assembly, the black assembly, I'm not sure of what the whole acronym meant, but uh, there wasn't enough um, people of color, black people in the audience. And I, I just think that there needs to be uh, another group that is, is bringing those voices together um, and sharing those, the needs and the, the opinions and the interests of, you know, the black community, because in a lot of ways we are not coming together and I just you know, wish there was a way to um, a group that would form that would bring those voices together. Um, the AHR, I feel like it really needs to focus and strategize um, on how it is going to move forward. Like could there just be one talk, not topic, but one area of repair um, because we know that there are a lot of issues in the community and if, you know, AHRA just would like to focus on one of them and at the listening session, there was um, a lot of comments on the school system and the educational system and how, you know, black students are being treated. Um, so maybe that would be an area that would be good to focus on. Um, also, the commitment to the, the funds that have been committed um, through the town. I, I just feel like there should be some fundraising around or, or attached to that because again, um, there's just not clarity around what, what the funds would be used for, um, how the funds you know, would be used. It's just a lot of questions that are still, you know, up in the air that, you know, I really think, I don't know who else is, is, is um, interested. Maybe there's, you know, working people are just, you know, caring for their families and, you know, don't have time to put them in, but it would really be good to have, you know, clarity around, you know, just how funds would be used. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, the last thing, I'm sorry, I'm going on too long. The last thing is um, when um, I've been thinking a lot about 
you know, just the, the whole town and what's going on in the town. And um, I just would like to share this last thought that um, when we look outward uh, to repair harm that has been done to us, there's always going to be a cost. But if we look inward and we look within ourselves and within, you know, those who you know, really understand and are close to us and we can find that in our community, you know, we can make repair and we can make it a lot faster than always looking outward. So I think. I'm sorry, Lauren, you keep going in and out and we, and we can't, I can't quite hear you to type up what you're saying, which sounds very important. So I don't know. Um, if you're moving or not? No, I'm trying. I'm trying to stay right next to the phone. Yeah, just keep your keep your. I think maybe your head face toward the speaker because it sounds like it, it, you're going in and out a bit. Okay, that's just probably my phone. But I, the last thing I'll just I'll just try to say what I said lastly again is that we need to look inward to heal ourselves and repair ourselves. And also, we are looking outward and, and looking to see what the town will do and so forth. But we really need to start healing ourselves from within. And so we need, we need to just come together as a Black community and hopefully in conjunction with what the town is doing and not just wait on what, what the town has put together for reparations. Thank you very much, Lauren. And Jennifer, I think you know how to reach Lauren if there's any follow up in terms of that comment. Thank you so much for those thoughtful comments and suggestions. Um, and actually, Lauren brings up, uh, let me just see if there's anyone else with their hand raised. I do see that another attendee has come in since we called public comment. So I just want to let that person know that if they would like to make public comment, they can use the raise hand function now. Um, and we'll also try to get another public comment in um, toward the end of our meeting. Okay, wonderful. Um, one of the uh, really important, I think, pieces that Jennifer and I talked about when we were unpacking the listening session, um, Lauren has raised with respect to how do we reach uh, our, our Black residents and not expect that they will come to us wherever we might set up, whether it be a physical location or a virtual even location. And so how might we think creatively as a committee about getting into the uh, areas in town that we know there might be um, more Black residents living in and go right to those places? So um, specifically, Jennifer and I talked about, for example, Village Park. And could we go ahead and plan, for example, our next listening session to be at Village Park. And it may not be that if we're doing multiple and consistent listening sessions, all members of this committee may not be available for each listening session, but we could potentially have a couple of us available to go to listening sessions so we can create more listening and more consistency and go out into go out to the people as opposed to making them uh, find us and come to us. I think Lauren brings up a great point about working, um, you know, an evening. I think Jennifer said this, an evening during the week is very tough, even though we provided childcare, but to get up and leave the house, um, you know, I think if a weekend um, may be more suitable, um, it is getting colder. So we'll have to think about if we, for example, go to Village Park, <laughs> We um, use their community space. Um, Jennifer also had an incredible idea of hosting a basketball tournament um, that I would like for her to speak more to. But I think we do need to really 
try to solidify our next two to three sessions and how how we want to see those go. Um, and we need to do that with some urgency here because now we've started the momentum and we need to be consistent about that. So um, I'd like to see what the committee thinks about uh, one of myself and Jennifer together um, calling, for example, Village Park and seeing if we can use the community room and seeing if there's a date in the near future that we can go to Village Park and host a listening session. Um, and then other ideas, please, are welcome. And I don't know if Dr. Shabazz, if you wanted to address BAM, um, Lauren had had mentioned BAM, and if you have anything that you'd like, or, or Dr. Rhodes, or anyone who's been more in contact with that. Sure. I, uh, I, I hear um, the point being raised in terms of um, the organizing of the Black community to get more members of the Black community out. Um, I was actually pleased at the listening session. I saw people, I saw Black uh, people there that I hadn't seen before, uh, in whether in electronic formats or, or, or otherwise. So I was actually quite pleased that, that someone found us out and, uh, and attended and, uh, and participated. So it's really just a matter of the process. The point is that, that I agree with the uh, comment made that we don't have an organized Black community. As far as I can tell from my reading of Amherst history, we've never had a, a much of an organized Black community. Um, we've had a couple of churches, and those, those are institutions that bring some, uh, some level of organization um, uh, effectively to from what I understand of the attendance roles of those churches, you know, you're you're talking less than 50 people, uh, you know, um, 50, 50 people of African descent. And I only say that to say that this is the challenge. The challenge is we don't have uh, mass organizations of Black people. Uh, there's no NAACP branch here. Uh, it, it, it's, it's uh, went defunct. Um, we have no uh, we have these two black churches with attendance roles, combined attendance roles of less than less than 50 uh, people of African descent. Um, and um, that's it. So to to wish there was a black black community organization that, you know, has access to 100, 200, 300, 400 of the African-American residents of Amherst. Absolutely. I'd love it. I'd rejoice. We don't have it. And so BAM has attempted to do what it has done. We have a list now of over 100 names. And those people, we, we did notify about the listening session. Some of them came out. There were people in the audience from the BAM list that came out. But uh, but again, that is our challenge. That is our challenge. And I, I think um, to wish for, uh, to call into existence a new group or wish for a new group, I'm, I'm open to any suggestion, any suggestion whatsoever. Sorry. Thank you, Dr. Shabazz. I'm sorry, I was muted there. Um, Jennifer, do you want to add to some of the thinking? You had a lot of really good thinking and strategy around getting out into the community. Um, and I talked about a little bit, but would you be willing to add to that? Sure. We're all, it just, we're all staying muted today. So it, it just seems like there needs to be some in, in maybe intensified community engagement with the Black community. We are here. They exist. You know, they're in multiple different places throughout the town. And it's kind of how do we get, how do we bring everybody together or how do we inform everyone or get everyone the, the, the right amount of information? So like, from my, and this is only my experiences of things, but one of the best things that Crocker Farm ever did was start to provide buses to after school events that they were hosting, like 
that would go to the different areas in the neighborhood where it was known that people didn't have cars or didn't have the transportation to get to Crocker Farm. And while I think that we could do something like that, like at the Hitchcock Center and bus people in, but before we go there, we really need to go to ground zero and start collecting or not collecting, that's not the right word, but start informing community members. And really it could take one or two different areas of places where you can go and because everybody you know people are connected in multiple different ways across town and throughout town that you can potentially have something and you would have to be pretty consistent about it but you could like if you hosted an event two or three times in one location consistently that information is going to get spread throughout town to some degree with, with people just because that's the way the nature of of the way the town works, but um, absolutely, we don't have an organized group, um, and people are, you know, honestly, you know, as far as I'm concerned, the town of Amherst is divided in multiple reasons from in multiple ways that are just, you know, it's too bad, right? So, how do we get everybody to actually come together? And, and to meet and to talk about this. And I think that it's very important because some of the inf things, the reparations are going to, or potentially programming that could happen through reparations has will affect people throughout the town. And they all, you know, need to have some kind of stake or voice in it. And I think even the door knocking needs to be, it would be great if it were the members of this committee who were doing the door knocking, just, be, and again, speaking from, you know, my perspective and how I feel, I don't know if I would value that information coming from someone who couldn't answer the questions that I needed because they're not fully invested in it in the way that the folks on this group are. So I just, you know, I just think that some some pretty heavily intensive uh, community engagement needs to happen at the uh, boots on the ground level and then move forward from there where we can get to the point of busing people to a specific location. And naturally, everything with community engagement always in requires food. Right? It's just if you don't have the food, uh, like food and child care, probably two of the most important things that, you know, at, at community engagements often. So. And I got a little criticism for my food that I provided at the listening session because it was all <laughs> sugar. <laughs> Only by Ms. Bridges, I think, but maybe a couple uh. others also. <laughs> um, no, I'm totally joking. Um, but it was all sugar because when I went to the big Y, I think I was having a carb craving or something. Um, <laughs> so I got a bunch of cookies. Um, anyway, <laughs> I see Ms. Bridges and then Dr. Rhodes. Um, I think what Jennifer said hits, hits the nail on the head. And I also think that a lot of the black community in Amherst aren't all together. There's a lot of pockets, pockets, pockets. I think if no matter what you don't agree on from one or the other, I think that's separating people and what they need to do is everybody has their own opinion. But I think the black community in Amherst needs to get together all together. And, and, you know, it, it, it's not going to help if, you know, I don't like what that one said, or I don't like what this one did. You need to get together, period. Like, you know, come on now. You just want to say, get together and talk out your, you talk it out. That's, that's what's going to, that's the only thing I think that can help more here. And, and then you could have maybe more, a little more people with boots on the ground, a little more um, of the black community uh, joining in with boots on the ground. I it's think just, that, that would help a lot. I just want to jump in there real quick and just say again that there's community members that don't know that the local government is here to represent them because it's not been representing them, right? So part of it is still just an educational piece to, like to empower our community, right? Like that's the whole point of boards and committees is that you all are supposed to empower yourself so that you can go out and help empower the community so that the community feels empowered, right? So, you know, yeah. We should get together and get out more. Dr. Rhodes? You know, what I was struck by was, in terms of the audience at the listening session, was who was not there. Uh, when I 
think about all the people that I know, kinds of people who have uh, high profiles, African-Americans who have high, high profiles in Amherst, they were not there. And that is concerning uh, as to why were they not there? It would be great to know why were they not there? Uh, because absent that particular group uh, of people, uh, Black African Americans who were not there, it's concerning. And the it would be really good to find out why. And then from that why, work towards gaining uh, their attendance and their and their people that they know. Uh, uh, attending these kinds of uh, events. Dr. Rhodes, can you clarify what you mean when you say high profile black residents? There are some black residents who have a higher profile than other black residents who have been involved in town uh, and in the town for all, you know, for different kinds of reasons. Uh, who have uh, large followings, um, but they weren't there. Mm -hmm. And do you, in your mind, view those residents as having access to the uh, sort of greater numbers of Black residents, or how do you see that relationship? But you know, it's like everything else. It's uh, uh, those particular people have their own followings. Mm -hmm. And um, that that really is something that we have to tap, tap into. They have large followings. When I say large followings, they, they may have 20, 30, 50 people uh, who follow them, uh, who are with them. Uh, and, uh, and when I looked out over, over the audience, none of them were there, I mean, zero. And that's sort of like, well, why? You know, um, and, uh, you know, I can share some of those names of people on this, you know, offline and people can reach out and ask the question, why? Yeah, I think that's really an interesting um, point. And, uh, you know, I think one of the things that we tried or that we talked about prior to the listening session was each of the assembly members reaching out to five or 10 people that they know. Um, and I think that most of us did do that. Um, and so I think that thinking about why folks wouldn't engage. And I'd really like to check in with Robin Rue Simmons in Evanston and talk with her. They have a much larger Black community, I think close to 20%. Um, so that's a different, a bit of a different situation than ours. Uh, but how, what what challenges maybe did they have and how did they overcome those challenges? And I think education is a key component. Um, I saw Yvonne and then Ms. Bridges, I think you might not have access to your hand raising. So I saw you raise your physical hand. Is that right? Oh, no. Okay. Um, so Yvonne, yes. Uh, I had raised my hand for one thing, but some of what um, Dr. Rhodes said, I feel it reverberates. I'm, you know, like I really understand and I think that that might be another thing that we could discuss how to get at those pockets of people who have their own constituents. And also, yes, the question, why were they not there? You know, I think there could be more than, oh, they didn't know, or maybe it's as simple as they, you know, um, were not available. You know what I mean? To come. I mean, there's lots of reasons why folks don't make it somewhere, but we could feed into that more in a political way, why folks didn't show up. But I think that that's conjecture and that we don't actually want to take that road. We want to at least be like, oh, let's see if we can identify who those folks are and make our a, a concerted effort, a very genuine effort to make sure that they understand what's um, what we're trying to achieve and um 
I, my initially I raised my hand because I was um, agreeing with some of what Jennifer said, which is there's a lot of folks who are hesitant to get involved because they don't know that um, that folks like us are here um, trying to move something forward that they will benefit from. Because there, there's always been like, oh, you you know, you take that risk, you put your neck out, and then you don't get anything back in return. Right. So I feel that we, there are two levels that of overcoming that we need that that's going to be our responsibility. Some of it is the um, public information that we talked about and this real, you know, we need to just add this to our list of things that are, are, are things that we need to address in order to get at the folks we want to make sure are included. You know, so one one is exactly what Jennifer said, which is overcoming this idea that it's not for me right, that I don't belong and it's not for me and it's gonna be a waste of time. So why should I go to this meeting, right? So I think that that's number one, that we have to um, um, and you know engender um, trust. So there has to be a way for us to engender trust. And the other one are those folks who have their own constituents, they're these um, leaders in the community that for some reason may not be able to come or may not want to participate. It might be the same reason why they don't want to participate. It might also be, oh, why do I need to put effort into this? Because there's not going to be a yield. And so again, it's about trust, but also in this area, it's about networking and including those folks in, in planning. Because if they're included in planning, they're going to make sure that they're there and their folks are there. Um, so those are the two areas I think we might want to spend some time strategizing, create, creating a strategy. And I only use strategy because um, strategy is not the right word because um, sometimes strategy can, can mean like ulterior motive or something. And there's nothing, no, there's nothing shady about this. This is, you know, all on the up and up, it's up front. And I think that we need, I mean, for lack of a better word, we need a strategy in order to, create that trust amongst those particular, and I'm sure there's other um, subgroups that fall into what the ones that I outlined. But I know what you're talking about, Irv, the Dr. Rhodes. I understand there's groups, you know, of people who the, you know, the, it's, it's this click mentality, you know, and sometimes the folks have their click and they're like, this is my click. So I'm not sharing that click. It's my, it's, this is my crew, you know, and I think we want to get beyond that with this, in particular with this. It's important for us to, you know, this all feeds into um, Miss Mills, who was here a few minutes ago talking about this same thing. This is what it is. We have to, there are these things that are, a, a, they have come from um, the Black experience. These are things that are inherent, that have come from oppression. These um, ways that people adapt in order to survive some of these difficult and oppressive experiences that Black people have. So it's not, I mean, I don't want us to think that these things are negative. They're just what we, they are just things that we also need to fold into our strategy. Do you understand what I'm saying? Some people think it's like, oh, well, this is, this is negative. I mean, it can have some negative connotations, just like anything else. But in our, in this instance, it's you know, it's stuff that's it's um, remnants of a time at current and past of oppression, and so we need to think about, oh, well, how do we how do we engender this trust? Because there's a reason why there was a lack of trust <laughs> to begin with. Right. We're in this, you know, we're, we're a town committee. We can't forget that we're a town committee. And this reparations is about undoing some of the racist practices of this town that we are a committee of. Right. So we have to be put that into our strategy as well. Absolutely. Dr. Rhodes. Yeah, um, all of the list that. Uh, 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 you, Michelle, sir, uh, shared with us in terms of who you reached out to. All of those uh, on those lists were the people I, I was, I'm referring to. Uh, I also know that those people were part of the uh, uh, BAM list that was sent out. 
uh, you know, from the ban, ban list that we, we have, they received those notifications. Uh, and again, um, it is, you know, baffling as to why, and it would be good to know why. So one thought I have, or actually two, um, the meeting we had on Thursday was public and we are a public body. And I think that what Yvonne is speaking to is very, very um, critical for us to think about because um, trust is, is, is very important in this process. And um, I'm wondering how we might have uh, focus groups that aren't public that maybe are, um, and I would have to of course speak with the town manager and our town clerk to see if there are ways that one member can meet with a focus group of people and then be able to report that back. I'm not sure if that's doable, but something worth looking into. The other thing is building off of what um, as Mills was saying about, and that Dr. Rhodes, I think, has really been focusing us on is getting some kind of survey or questionnaire out to the community. Um, and more I think about it, I do think a representative survey, as Dr. Rhodes has talked about it, is something really important that we should invest in. But I'm wondering if even before that, if we can build a simple questionnaire that can go out um, and, you know, for example, with rental registration, um, and I know that's a very, very different topic. So I'm not, you know, I'm aware of that. But they put a very simple questionnaire out and got, I think, 400 responses through the Engage Amherst page. So we've got to find other ways to be reaching people too. And I encourage us to think about not overthinking a questionnaire and let's just get something together that we can start to get out and that we can build on over time, but not letting, um, not stop, not just starting with something simple and then um, getting it more finessed as we get feedback. Um, so that's something that we can think about for our next meeting. I'll put some thoughts together around those things um, and about, I'll get some information about what we can do within the um, confines of the open meeting law in terms of being in contact with people and, and listening to people in ways that aren't necessarily public. Um, yes, Jennifer. And so I just think it takes all of these different ways to get everyone together, right? So there's no one way about going through. It's a large enough town where people are spread out enough and divided by multiple different reasons, right? And so it will take all of those different suggestions that we've talked about today to, to get everyone together, if not even more, right? So... I just think we have to keep moving forward with, and I think a big piece of it is being consistent, right? Like, so when the, as um, community participation officers during the pandemic, we started attending the mobile market with folks trying to engage. And so while we stayed separate away from them and the first few times, like no one really came and paid us any attention, but as we sat there over and over again, week after week, people started to engage with us. So one of the things that I find is that you have to have that consistency. So it's not like you can just do one thing at the Hitchcock Center and say, four months later, let's do something else. I mean, you, we need to have like a schedule of things that are going to be pretty consistent so that as the word is getting put out, people know where to go and where to look and and move forward that way. Absolutely. So maybe I can, um, maybe we can get together, Jennifer, and if Pamela is available, and we can create a schedule that we can then propose at our next meeting um, for approval by the committee, and 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 of course um, feedback from the committee. Yes, Yvonne. Uh, you were just talking about a survey. So would that also be another way? Like that survey would be online, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And then and then so we could publicize that survey as a way for folks who may not want to do stuff in person, but they could do that online. 
right? So it would multiple ways, uh, it's sort of like, you know, it's what Jennifer is saying, except also not in person, right? You can also do it this way, you can do it that way, multiple different ways of being able to engage. Absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah, I think that maybe we can come up with a short questionnaire slash survey and a, a schedule for consistent outreach to bring back for proposal um, to the group. And then figuring out how we actually execute on that is a big a conversation. Um, okay. So we have, um, I know, Ms. Bridges, did you have to leave at three o'clock today? Okay, so um, there, I believe, okay, Lauren has her hand raised. Lauren, if that is a holdover from last time, um, you do have your hand raised. If it's not, I'm going to just leave it up and just, uh, I'll come right, I'll come back to you. Um, Dr. Shabazz uh, has sent over something um, to give us a framework for eligibility. I want to check in with our time frames here to see. I don't want us to sort of just, you know, speed through that. So if everybody has to get going within the next five or 10 minutes, we'll hold that and we'll bring that as our first point of discussion next week. Um, and that way we can call another public comment period and then whoever has to leave can leave. Does that work for everyone? Okay. Yes. Okay. Dr. Shabazz, is that good with you? Okay. Bye, Ms. Bridges. Thank you. <laughs> good to see you. Um, Dr. Rhodes, does that work okay for you? That's fine. Okay. All right. So um, if we could bring Lauren into the room, whoever's <laughs> working it, you. Hi. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. I, I I meant to lower my hand, but I did want to um, announce again that uh, with the help of the public health department and um, press was to be part of a community conversation that is going to be held at Butternut Farm um, this Thursday, November 3rd from 4 to 6. I wanted to share that with you all um, to invite you all. And um, I'm not sure if Earl is going to make it, but we're hoping that another crest responder will come and talk to the community about, about uh, the crest, a new crest program. And um, so I just wanted to make sure that I was able to, to share that with you guys. But um, also, I just, you know, I, I, you guys know that I'm a parent because I always mention that I'm a parent. And we've talked a lot about um, youth and you know what is missing in the town as far as you know where you you know feel safe and where they can go and and so forth and so i just um i'm i'm a little frustrated but i'm also trying to be you know engaged and so i i think that the cultural center that was proposed really needs to be like part of the the master planning and part of the conversation like during you know the other town meetings it, it needs to be more than just an idea and i i th i think part of my uh frustration um is that there's a lot of ideas that are are being expressed but the money the money that the town is allocating for certain projects is is going all over the place and and there's nothing really that that we are planning for the youth in this town and uh i've lived here for six years and i'm very concerned very still concerned i'm i just don't understand why we cannot commit to a, a particular project especially when you know we're we're talking about you know funds and and reparations at the same time i think there there has to be a a real focus and I think that will bring more people to the table and again yeah so I'll just do that. thank you Lauren um I just want to make sure I understand what you said about Thursday 
Is okay. that is that a is there an option for an AHRA member to speak for a couple minutes at that event if they were available? I'm sorry, I didn't give the topic. It's um it's mental health and stress and um the public um uh, health director Jennifer Brown is going to be there and hopefully a press responder will also be there to share um, what they're doing in the community. There is four to six and there will be like, you know, time to introduce people and, and you know, talk with who's there. But I, I don't think we'll have a like time to like explain a AHRA or, you know, reparations or something like that. It, it's more, you know, we're focusing on um, mental health and stress and then um, COVID, COVID questions. Like if anybody has any concerns about COVID questions, but whoever is there, hopefully there will be community members there and you can surely bring, you know, information and talk, you know, to those who are, who are there. But as far as the the that time frame it's gonna just be on the mental health and sure stress. okay that makes a lot of sense but it's open it's not only it's not limited to um butternut community outside members can come yes yes got it okay thank you for clarifying that and did you say it was this thursday i'm sorry yes it's this thursday four to six Okay, thank you, thank you, Lauren. Um, so I'll just check in with committee members to see if there are any final comments, questions, thoughts, reports, um, anything that members would like to add. Otherwise, we'll be meeting again next week at two o'clock, our usual time. I am finding that Alexis may be having a problem with that timing going forward. And so I'm going to actually call and check in with her and get a better sense of that. But for next week, we'll keep things the same. All right. Well, thank you very much. It was a great meeting. Um, Dr. Shabazz, I will send what you sent me to the packet so that we're ready and prepared to have that presented for next meeting. And I am going to adjourn at 3.09. Oh, Dr. Shabazz, please. Just announcing on Sunday at oh, yes, the yes. Unitarian Meeting House at 2 p.m., the public is invited to uh, Mojuba, a um, in veneration of our African ancestors, and uh, followed by an intergroup dialogue being sponsored by the Bridge for Unity. Um, and there will be wonderful uh, refreshments. Uh, Deborah Snow um, has been organizing from the Blue Heron Restaurant, from um, Hazel's, uh, from a number of other uh, providers, some really wonderful food. So 2 p.m. at uh, Unitarian Meeting House. And Dr. Shabazz, I'll get that out on both the, the multiple Facebook pages as well. Um, I'll make sure that gets out. ASAP. Um, yes, Jennifer. I would also say, Dr. Shabazz, you couldn't put it on the community calendar. That would be a good place for it. Um, if you go to the town website, um, individuals are allowed to go ahead and submit events that are coming up in the community. Thank you. That's great. If you have a flyer, I can send it to the PTOs too at the school. Great. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you all very much. And uh, we will see you next week. And it is 3 11 p.m. and we are adjourned. Thank you. Bye, everyone.